The Out of Bounds Show podcast is presented by the Premium Cigars at Havana Smoke Shop. Visit their two locations, I-55 in Jackson and on the res, for your premium cigar needs. Only at Havana Smoke Shop. WRKS Pickens Jackson. Are you ready? Now live from the Whiskey 61 Lounge inside the Bank Plus Studio. Listening to Mississippi's number one sports talk show, The Out of Bounds Show with Bo Bounds. Streaming worldwide live on the Out of Bounds radio app and on your radio at ESPN 105.9. The Soul. And the Out of Bounds Show is brought to you by the Great Stakes and Four Roses Bourbon at Kessler Prime and the Renaissance. Visit KesslerPrime.com to make a reservation. Ask if they have the soft shell crab. Get it as an appetizer or entree. Kessler Prime and the Renaissance. We're live in the Bank Plus studio. Streaming live on the Out of Bounds radio app for you. Steve Robertson coming up. 815 on the Modelo guest line. Dave Bar 2 will join us. 930. Wild man out of Oh, he's about a 30 minutes outside of Portland, Oregon. Dave Bar 2. College football matrix. The Godfather. Modern day recruiting. Bar 2 will join us at 930 today. Coaching effect. Plus one, minus one. Leach would have gotten a minus one had he lost. Instead, it was a it's a push. You get a you get a goose egg. Um, so coaching effect. What is the college football matrix? TLC. Talent on the roster. Location. Where's the game played? Coaching effect. Right? TLC. And um, so we'll talk to Bartu. Bartu will hang around for 20 minutes or so there at, at, during that, that 930 segment. I'm excited about the weekend. We had a text from Rebel Godfather who said, uh, we were talking about Joe Milton, the transfer from, before I get into Will Rogers and arm strength, give me one second here. Joe Milton is a transfer from the Michigan Wolverines to the Tennessee Volunteers. All right, big kid, looks good, athletic, looks like, I mean, he's got talent. I don't know how good he'll be at the end of the day under Josh Heupel, who Mike Leach recruited as his first quarterback at the University of Oklahoma, and Hypo won the national championship at Oklahoma two years later. But Hypo is now the head coach at Tennessee, and Ole Miss plays Tennessee a little bit down the line here uh, later in the season. So I was talking about Joe Milton, transfer QB from Michigan to Tennessee. Rebel Godfather said, I saw all I need to see in the second quarter against Bowling Green. Dude, I love you. And thank you for listening to the show. Take a time out. Uh, it's the first week of a kid just transferring in in a new offense, and it's just it's just a different deal. So, uh, yes, he may be the same all season, but three weeks from now, he may be totally different. You cannot you cannot replicate game speed in practice. We all know that. So, as much as coaches over the last 150 years of sports have tried to do it. And many, 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 many high school and college will try to do it today on the practice field. You cannot do it. It's not possible. So you got to get those game reps and you got to get hit in the nose a little bit. And as much as I love Matt Corral today, Matt Corral did not look this good two years ago. All right. And when they played him as a true freshman, he was a deer in headlights. So yep. let's give some of these guys like Joe Milton and Will Rogers and Haynes King and some of the Max Johnson, some other guys, some time to maybe figure it out. KJ Jefferson at Arkansas out of the state of Mississippi in North Panola. We'll see, but you need some more reps. You need to have success and make mistakes. And as Peyton Manning said over the weekend, I threw six interceptions against the San Diego Chargers. Who cares? Okay. <laughs> and y'all get bogged down with picks more than I do, kind of like errors in baseball. But anyway. So let's go. I, I want to mix in a little Will Rogers and Jameer Calvin before we go to Steve Robertson. All right. Mississippi Ag text line is 601-885-3776. I want you to know that Blake and I can't thank you enough for listening to the show. Uh, it, it's, we've had an awesome year. We're excited about football. I know you are. Week one was awesome. We've got Dak and Tom Brady tomorrow night Oof. and then a big weekend 
Uh, the Ole Miss game's not going to. It's going to be fun. <laughs> You'll win big. Mississippi State, North Carolina State is a big game for Mike Leach. Now, le- first, Leach seems to be getting beat, beaten up at times. And I know it is. Um, uh, it's the vocal minority, right? I, I get that on message boards and on our Mississippi Ag text line, but we love the feedback. And so I do want to point this out. Without Mike Leach, you don't get Makai Polk or Jameer Calvin. Um, Dan Mullen was not landing those transfers. And the one transfer that Joe Moorhead landed, um, was his name Zuber? Isaiah Zuber. Isaiah Zuber caught like four four balls transferring in from Kansas State. He's still, he is on the New England Patriots practice squad. So he's not that bad. (laughs) So which means you make like... $250,000 a year if he can hang on. So all here's what the impact of what Mike Leach does as a coach. Jameer Calvin just transferred in. He still doesn't know where all the restaurants are in Starville. If you called him to go to uh, X, Y, and Z apartment complex, he'd have to figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. He transferred in from Washington State. And Blake, will you pull up his stats for Saturday? And Polks, please. Yes. And they had a bigger impact than any receiving transfers that you probably ever had in the program. So as Mike Leach is trying to get this thing up and running with a super young team, following Joe Moorhead, really gutting the program. And, you know, I get more ways than one. Um, Physically and psychologically. There is something to, to that, the fact that he was able to land two transfers that are ready to go. That's not what you are at Mississippi State usually. But because of the staff knew about these guys, well, one, they played for them, and the other one they recruited, Makai Polk from Cal Berkeley, Jameer Calvin, older guys, Jameer Calvin from Washington State, gives you a really good, for you, wide receiving unit. What was his stat? What were his stats? Makai Polk caught 10 for 57. Calvin caught three for 67 and a touchdown. Okay. Uh, so 13 of your 39 completions go to the new guys. And uh, what's incredible is, like you mentioned, to bring in the level of transfer that these receivers were. Uh, Makai Polk, in two seasons at California, had caught uh, just under 400 yards. And. Jameer Calvin in two two and a half seasons because Washington State only played four games gotcha. in 2020. Gotcha. In two and a half seasons, he had caught a thousand yards. Okay, so like you said, that's you don't, you don't ever bring that level of talent in at that position in 120 years. You haven't brought that level of talent in. And you'll add Malik Heath on uh, this week. So so again, you've got let's go through it. You got Jaden Wiley, Malik Heath, Jameer Calvin, and Makai Polk, and Tulu, and some other Austin Williams. But he's got to stop fumbling the football. Um. And so that is a group that you have not had. Now, is it is it the greatest thing since sliced bread? No. But that is a really, really good group considering who you are. And both of those guys were involved from the jump. That's that like slant seam route that Calvin caught on his touchdown was a great catch and then run after catch for all the people who say, Well, Will Will Rogers can't throw it forty yards downfield, so they must not go vertical. It's a vertical passing game right there. You hit the guy at 17 yards, and then he took it another 20 yards. I think Will's arm strength is going to be fine. Um, you know, again, he's still learning, and, and it's a new deal for him. But like you said, um, they, do, they do need to push it a little bit more, and, and they're looking to throw the ball uh, 10 to 20 yards down the field from the line of scrimmage. Then you let the wide receiver do the work. You're, you're not completing passes 40 and and. 45 and 50 yards down the field. What you're hoping is to find guys in the right spot, um, 10, 15, 20 yards down the field, and then let them do some work and grab another 5 to 10 yards, sometimes more. And that's an explosive play, as we all know, because 20 yards are considered explosive plays. That's where Ole Miss offense lives. I mean, they explosive play you to death. If they can run two plays, you know, they can be at their um, 30. And they can run two plays, and they're on your 25. And that is that is powerful, potent, and uh, and scary in the world of college football. It took them two minutes to score from their five-yard line Monday night against Louisville. And that's a long time. Yeah. All right, Steve Robertson's going to join us on the Modelo guest line coming up next. The Out of Bounds Show, ESPN 105.9 The Zone. It's a Wings Wednesday. 
Brought to you by an ice cold Modelo. And you can find delicious wings at Sal and Mookie's in Madison and Sal and Mookie's in Jackson, Eastover District. You're listening to the Out of Bounds Show podcast, presented by Independent Roofing Systems. If you want it done right the first time, visit Independent Roofing Systems today. Everybody, listen carefully. You're listening to the SEC Insider Hit Hit. on the Bolt Bound Show. Fueled by Fleetway Market. Fuel up your car and cooler at Fleetway this football season. Let's go. Good morning. Welcome in. We'll have Steve Robertson here in just a few seconds. He will join us on the Modelo guest line. Fuel up at Fleetway Market. Football season hunting camp. Road trips. Fuel up at Fleetway Market. Steve Robertson joins us on the Modelo guest line. Jeans page 247 Sports. Steve, what are you hearing inside the building on the offensive line? Do they feel like uh, they can correct some of the stuff that uh, was a little bit sloppy over the weekend against Louisiana Tech? Yeah, I mean, that's that's been the word, you know. I mean, it's, it, they felt like that they, they did have some protection issues, and the, some of that's just a couple of guys uh, kind of being in unfamiliar surroundings, but uh, they believe it's correctable. You know, you had a couple of issues where, you know, Will Rogers might have held on the football a little bit too long. And so, I mean, th- you know, those things are easy to repair. And so the, the hope is they can get that cleaned up this week. I think one of the things, too, you got to look at, too, is, you know, Dollar Bill Johnson had a couple of issues uh, last week. And then, of course, he's picked up on malicious mischief here earlier this week. You know, so what does that mean for the starting lineup on Saturday? Does that give Cole Smith an opportunity to slide in there at right guard? I guess we'll find out. What do you think? Do you think Cole Smith will, will get the call on Saturday? I think I think I probably would. I mean, it's, it's one thing that, you know, if, if it's just a matter of this kind of working through maybe a disappointing showing it's one thing but then you know you immediately go out and you, you have some uh you know some extra corrector activity that is that is detrimental to the program yeah you know, i think cole probably starts and um you know we'll kind of see how it goes from there i don't think it's a you know a career ender or anything like that sure I just think, you know, you, you got to send a message right steve robertson uh the boneyard podcast on the Modelo guest line scott lashley was the offensive lineman player of the week uh so he played Pretty well or really well, Steve? I thought he played pretty well. And, and I'll be honest with you, you and I have talked about, you know, the offensive line and, you know, being the one personnel group on the offense that probably were some question marks about. And I think he was probably the biggest question mark, not because of the talent standpoint, but it's because of the fact he just hadn't played a whole lot. And then he goes out and uh, wins the offensive lineman of the week. I did think he played well. I don't remember getting a lot of push on that right side at all. And uh, so, yeah, I, th- I think maybe – you know, Mason Miller has kind of found the guy's currency, and, and maybe he'll be a solid contributor this year. What about the left side with Cam Jones at left guard and Charles Cross at left tackle? What are you hearing on that? I mean, yeah, it's just a matter of getting those guys some reps, you know, together. The uh, you know, That's the thing, I guess, you know, when you've got a guy that was a right tackle and you got a guy that needs, um, you know, it's moved over to left guard, there's going to be an adjustment. I mean, that's just kind of how life works. It's just, it's it's two two different positions in a matter of speaking. And, uh, you know, I'm getting some background noise. I have no idea what that is. But, okay. We'll check but, it. Um, but, but, but nevertheless, this, this whole thing with Tim and, and uh, Charles Cross is just getting those guys some game reps together on that left side. Because, you know, when there's those stunts and twists, you've got to pass guys off. You've got to be able to pass them off. You've got to be able to communicate. I don't know that that happens uh, in game one. I think you've got to get it figured out in game two and, and kind of move forward. And it's not like these guys aren't capable of making the adjustments, and I, I believe they certainly will. Steve Robertson on the Out of Bounds Show. Mississippi State will play North Carolina State Saturday night. They're an underdog, two and a half points. You mentioned Will Rogers. Um, Jameer Calvin talked about his poise and his ability to shake off what had happened to the team in the second and third quarter and have a tremendous fourth quarter. Uh, talk a little bit about what your takeaway was, Calvin talking about. Calvin, who's a guy who understands what Leach and them want to do, Steve, because he played at Washington State. And and what was your takeaway from the post game and him talking about Will Rogers? 
Well, I think Jameer Calvin sounds a lot like Mike Leach when he talks, and that just kind of stands to reason he's been in the program for three years. You know, he's a guy that understands what Leach expects. And of all the guys that are playing wide receiver at Mississippi State, nobody's got more snaps in this in this game than Jameer does. And, you know, I, I thought Jameer said some big things last night as well as in post game, and, and he really credited Will Rogers for being the guy that led them back. And he says, we don't win the game without Will. And I thought probably the most significant thing that he said was is Will was the same guy throughout the ball game, no matter what was going on. And that's what you need. You need that guy in the huddle that's going to be that settling personality, a guy that can kind of keep guys focused and keep them locked in. And, you know, we had a couple of issues in the second and third quarter, but when the game was on the line, Will Rogers stepped up and made the throws necessary to win. I, he may not – he doesn't have great arm talent, but I think he's got more than enough arm talent to throw the ball 10, 20, 25 yards down the field in the air raid. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think he's capable of doing what, what Mike Leach wants to do. And it's like a lot of people hear air raid and they think you're out there throwing Hail Marys every play. And that's just, you know, that's, that's just not what the offense is. And that's not what Will Rogers is going to do. But, yeah, you know, it, I do think his arm strength has improved over last year. You know, it, is it elite? No, I don't think it is. But I think he's more than serviceable with the quarterback position. And, and that's the thing I go back to. It's, you know, 39 or 47 attempts on, on Saturday. And at least three of those were drops. Two of those were throwaways. So you look at a situation where your quarterback was accurate with the throw 45 out of 47 times. I, I think that dog will hunt. I don't think there's any question. Eleven of a, I think 11 of 11 in the fourth quarter, Steve. Is that right? Yeah, well, he was 10 of 10 in the fourth quarter, but okay. he closed the game on 11 for 11 straight. Got it. Got it. All right. Steve Robertson, the Boneyard Podcast, jeanspage.com on the Modelo guest line. So do you agree that, that this could be the most talented group um, as far as uh, skill position at MSU with Marks, Wally, Polk, Calvin, Heath, Tulu, and that group? Steve? Yeah, I think you could make that argument. Now, you know, of course, we're just basing this off potential rather than production at this point. You know, that's that's the issue. It's like you look at these guys and – they went around. You've got a lot of good talent at the wide receiver position. It's just going to be a matter of putting it all together. And I think you go out and get Makai Polk, and we've talked about him several times on your show, and then he goes out and, and has 10 catches the very first, uh, you know, appearance of his Bulldog career. And so, you know, I'm excited about what he brings to the table, and I think that there's a lot of guys out there that can make some plays. And it's not like in years past where, you know, if you had a guy go down, the season's kind of over. You know, it's just I think there's enough depth there and there's enough – you know, opportunities for guys to get out and be impactful. But, you know, this is an offense that, that I think can really move the football. And I think there's some wide receivers out there that are probably a lot different than anything that Mississippi State's had in the past. How does the Mississippi State defense stack up against a North Carolina State offensive line that is considered the best in the ACC and Zonovan Knight and then also another back that are big and physical and very talented? Steve? Yeah, it's going to be a much different scenario than what they saw last week just because of the fact that, you know, NC State wants to run the football and kind of grind you out. And, I, and honestly, I think that's probably a better matchup for State. It's because, of, you know, that, that's exactly on the net and those guys' mentalities. We're going to stop the run first. I, I think you have to make them one-dimensional. You can't let them sit there and dictate terms to you. But this is an offensive line. It's, it's got veteran guys. You've got a couple of guys on there that expect you to play pro football. And the Mississippi State defensive line, I think, is very talented. But you know what? They didn't generate much push last week, you know, on, on the pass rush. And I think, you know, maybe not having Demonte Russell, maybe not having Jack Harris available, uh, and, of course, not having Jordan Davis available. I mean, you know, that's three of your top four defensive ends that were available last week. And so, you know, they're going to have to generate some pass rush without, you know, blitzing four and five people. At some point, you've got to be able to get out there and make some plays. And, you know, it's going to be a real tall task for them. But the job one for Mississippi State defense is to – stop that running game and that's going to be easier said than done what did you hear anything on their sunday and tuesday practices as far as nc state no 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 mississippi state as far as leach challenging the team or maybe having oh yeah 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 i was told you know sundays are typically kind of a cleanup practice where you kind of you know work through your issues and kind of clean up some things from saturday but i was told that uh, this sunday was more like a regular practice that it wasn't you know, wasn't a typical little walk through cleanup field. They got they went out there and got after it. And uh, I understand there was a lot of intensity in practice, and 
Jameer Calvin told us yesterday that these last couple practices have been pretty high. And uh, I think that's what Bulldog fans want to hear. Yeah. You know, is that, hey, we won the ball game, but you know what? we got some things we got to correct, and we're working to get that done. We'll leave it there. May grab Steve a little bit later in the week. Steve Robertson, the Boneyard Podcast, jeanspage.com on the Modelo guest line. You're listening to Out of Bounds, ESPN 105.9 The Zone. The show is brought to you by Juniker Jewelry Store in Madison. If you are in the market for an engagement ring or a wedding ring, you want to go to Juniker. Don't screw it up, guys. They'll walk you through the whole process at Juniker Jewelry Store in Madison on Highland Colony. We're live in the Bank Plus studio. Welcome in Dave Bartu at 930. It's a Wings Wednesday brought to you by Modelo. You can order award-winning Jonesy Q rubs and sauces at jonesyq.com. Use promo code OOBSHOW if you order $20 or more and receive free shipping. That's jonesyq.com. Promo code OOBSHOW. Good morning. Welcome in. Out of Bounds, ESPN 105.9 The Zone, brought to you by Went McGee, the mortgage man. He'll shop the best rates for you, mortgagemanms.com. show is also presented by the Premium Cigars at Havana Smoke Shop, two locations, I-55 North Frontage Road and across from Shaggy's. I want to switch gears with you for just a second. NFL starts this weekend. Dak Prescott. Cowboys, Tom Brady, Buccaneers tomorrow night. Um, You've got your Saints without Breeze. Jameis Winston's your starting QB. Some rookies that will play this weekend. Mac Jones out of Alabama will start for the New England. Well, my New England Patriots. Um, (laughs) And... You know, we've got a lot of really good, exciting storylines. You've got A.J. Brown and and Jeffrey Simmons just right up the road in Nashville. And they added a big piece. Well, several. But Julio Jones is a big name who's had a, a, a phenomenal career with the Atlanta Falcons out of the state of Alabama. And, um, and Julio's now with the Tennessee Titans, you know? So what, what, will, they, what will they do in that? division with uh it looks like it's set up for them right i mean the indianapolis colts i mean what's going on there with carson wentz uh the houston texans named tyrod taylor their starting quarterback and jacksonville's gonna go with trevor lawrence the rookie and urban myers also rookie season in the nfl this will be Mm -hmm. baptism by fire so it looks good for the titans and and aj brown and and uh Jeffrey Simmons. We'll we'll keep an oh, and some guy named Derrick Henry from Alabama is also the tailback. A lot of SEC flavor on, everywhere. I understand that, <laughs> but on that Tennessee Titans roster. So let me get into the NFL for just one second. The Athletic did a uh, countdown of the top 100 players in the NFL all to, all time. For example, Dick Butkus made the list. Um, number one is Tom Brady. I don't think that surprises you or me, but the the story that they tell as they named Brady the number one player of all time in the NFL is pretty remarkable, but it's typical Brady. I think all of us are are intrigued, sometimes obsessed, fascinated, shake our head at people who are the .0001% in their profession, industry, whatever it is, music, um, architecture, sports, technology, and medicine, and so on. And they they get right into it in this piece by uh, Jeff Howe. Julian Edelman and Tom Brady are working out in the offseason in Los Angeles at Tom Brady's gym. Brady is from the West Coast. He's had a place out there forever. You remember he uh, uh, had a relationship with an actress, um, Bridget Moynihan, had a child with her 20-something years ago. Then, of course, he's been married to Giselle forever. So they're working out, and Edelman uncovers this 
um, whiteboard in in Brady's gym, and it just said, this is 2013, and it says Super Bowl 53, February 2nd, 2014, MetLife Stadium. And at the time, Brady had three Super Bowl rings, which is unbelievable. Yeah. And But it's like this article says, it's modest by his standard. And so Julian Edelman asked Tom Brady, and this is the quote, bro, how crazy is it that you're going after Montana? Brady doesn't miss a beat. Doesn't miss a beat. I ain't going for Montana, Brady responded with an unmistakable air of confidence. And I quote again, I'm going for Jordan. Powerful. Goat material right there. Yeah. For as this is in the article, for as long as anyone can remember, Brady has kept a Super Bowl countdown clock in each of his home gyms, whether it was in Boston, Los Angeles, or now Tampa, as a way to remind himself of his eternal sacrifice. It's been said that the boards have been updated as early as the day after each year's Super Bowl. New year. New mission, same chase. It's a good read on theathletic.com. Tom Brady was ranked the number one player of all time in the NFL on theathletic.com as they as they did their top 100. More Super Bowls individually than any one franchise in league history. How about that? Which is incredible. And with two different franchises yeah. now. Yeah, which probably a lot of us never really thought might happen. You no. know, I think everybody kind of thought just he would just ride off into the sunset in New England. I love this uh, story a little bit later when they're talking to Rob Gronkowski. Uh, you know, Gronk got towards ACL in two thousand in the, in the end of the playoffs that the year they're talking about, and he was talking to Brady with a torn. You know, he tore his ACL during the playoffs, so they didn't get him, didn't have him. And Brady, you know, basically told him, uh, you know, hey, you owe me some Super Bowls because you missed this season. And Gronk was like. You know, when he got injured, quote, I, when he got injured, I, he wished I was out there in the playoffs. He was excited for me to come back. He was like, you owe me a couple more Super Bowls. And I'm like, why is that? Brady responds, because you got injured this year. I need you out there. And then Grant goes, and it dawned on me. He didn't say one Super Bowl. He said Super Bowls. That's the way Tom Brady, you miss one season. Now you owe me multiple Super Bowls. That's incredible. Like that attitude is so less than .01%. I know. It's amazing. Seven Super Bowls. Yeah, six with the Patriots, now one with Tampa. And look, they're the odds-on favorite to be back in it this year out of the NFC. You think this is it for him? I'll never say that. I know. At this point, I, I thought it 10 years ago, though. I'm not going to say it until he just decides it is what it is. I was a Brady – I don't think I was a Brady hater. I was a Patriot Dynasty hater for a little while. I because, could see that in you. Well, because, A – it just the way they did it wasn't fun for a lot of reasons. Like they weren't fun to watch a lot of times. You know, it took years for Brady to take that offense over and truly like become the dominating force and run it or throw it and all that stuff. Right. So it wasn't like they were the fun team to root for. Okay. But the more you look at Tom Brady and the more you dive into Tom Brady, it's he is one of those guys where if you could get an hour to talk to anybody, he's at the top of the list. Oh, it, because he does have an unbelievable personality. You just never got to see it in New England. Exactly. You're right. He's got some Phil Mickelson in him, or vice versa. But with more success. Uh, yeah, and Phil's been wildly successful. Yeah. It's just Brady's, a, the, I mean, yeah. look, he's been to 10 Super Bowls. No one's ever done that. Okay. He's won seven. No one's ever done that. It, it's And the the quote that you started this article with, you know, I'm not going after Montana. Well, for those who don't know, Joe Montana was the Super Bowl record holder at four, right? He was the guy. For quarterbacks. Yes, yeah. correct. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, quarterbacks. Uh, which is still, I mean, that's incredible. Four Super Bowls, that's ridiculous. For Brady to kind of, not in a disrespectful way, but to say that's so far below where I'm shooting that I don't even acknowledge it, I mean, that is amazing. I think Edelman's quote here about, Brady's competitiveness and he talks about how year after year without letting acknowledgements winning and adversity affect him it's unreal it's a killer instinct there's just only so many people that are wired like that like Jordan like Brady and some others and the fact that Brady didn't let the success um 
alter his drive or workout routine in the offseason. Made him work harder, yeah. which is not – I mean, look at Ed Orgeron and LSU. They got a tiny taste of success, and that party went off the rails in about 45 minutes. <laughs> and it ain't coming back, baby. Eddie O partying at but the Tom, uh, Roosevelt pool. Tom Brady – Wins a Super Bowl and goes, mm, I need six more. I need seven more. I need eight more. And I guarantee you, if you ask Tom Brady to talk about his Super Bowls, he's probably one who says, well, I lost three. Right. He doesn't say he won seven. He says he lost three. Do you know how hard that is? What man, what b- b- red-blooded American male would come up to you and say, well, I've been uh, you know, a salesman for 10 years, and seven of them I was first place in my company nationwide, but three I wasn't. How many of them come up and say, well, three years I didn't finish first? They don't. Everyone would come up and say, well, I was first place seven times. Tom Brady is just a, I mean, that is incredible. Well, and so they bring everybody back on this team, and uh, it's not awesome that they play the Dallas Cowboys tomorrow night. But Jerry's a, a glutton for punishment. He wanted to go open up the new Los Angeles Stadium last year. Well, I think it was last year, even during COVID, with the Rams. Um, and so now, uh, the Cowboys, I guess, because they're the Cowboys, uh, it's not because they're, I mean, they're a dysfunctional franchise, um, but they play Tampa Bay tomorrow night. Is that going to be on NFL network and Amazon and all that stuff? Blake? I believe tomorrow's is NBC. Okay. Are they doing the simulcast or is it? I'm going to pull it up right now. I don't know that. With Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth, and then they go do Sunday night uh, football, too? I believe that's correct. Okay. Uh, the Cowboys are seven-and-a-half-point dogs to Tampa Bay, by the way. Yeah. Oh? That's, really? a, big, that's a big line in the NFL. Seven-and-a-half, really? yeah. Okay. With no potentially no right guard, Zach Martin. That's all Dak needs is a... Injured offensive lineman to start the season. And what happened to him? He's not actually injured. He's on the COVID list. COVID. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So Zach Martin, who's missed a ton of time the last few years, um, has COVID and he's out for however long. All right. Well, I just want to share that story with Tom Brady. It's pretty amazing. Brady working out with Edelman and so on. Out of Bounds, 105.9 The Zone, ESPN. We're streaming live on the Out of Bounds radio app. We'll have... um, Dave Bartu join us at 9.30. He'll take a look at the Mississippi State-North Carolina State game because that's the game of the week uh, in the state considering Ole Miss plays Austin P. And he'll take us behind the scenes, talent, uh, location, coaching effect, what to look for, and so on. Mississippi State will have their hands full, but it's still an opportunity to win. It's a winnable game. For Mississippi State, it will be extremely difficult, but it is a winnable game and one that, man, if you can get that and then go to Memphis and win, even though it may not look pretty, which nobody cares. I mean, like the players and coaches don't care today. They have to say that they've turned the page on Saturday where we're still hanging on to certain plays or the fact that it wasn't pretty. But if you can start off three and oh, we talked about this with both Mississippi State and Ole Miss. If you can start off 3-0 and before you play LSU and before you play Alabama, Ooh. which is how the two schedules lay out, Ooh. boy, are you in a good spot as far as bowling. Now, Ole Miss has some pretty big dreams and aspirations as far as what bowl, how many wins they could grab and where they could end up as far as a bowl. Uh, but they're in a different spot right now than Mississippi State. Yeah. Um, they've got some older players and they've got obviously a veteran QB that is really good. And that offensive line Brocker, those dudes are, uh, you know, the joke is on us. We, we got some laughs from Matt Luke. Well, Matt Luke and, and Jacob Peeler and, um, you know, Derek Nix and a lot of those guys did a, did a really good job sec- securing some players that are outstanding. SEC players. Mm-hmm. So um, Matt may have never looked or felt right as far as um, a guy that was going to be able to be a head coach and and have and sustain success. But man, did they find some really good football players. And they've got some experience in some spots that you really need it when you're 
you know, in the world of college football. And obviously, O line, uh, Royce Newman just went to the NFL, right? Yeah, you can start I mean, Green with Bay the Packers. Packers yeah. And you got, you know, Brockers nasty um, on the offensive line for Ole Miss. Physical, you know, I mean, that dude is, is the deal. In the, and they've got more than him. So things look good there um, for Ole Miss. But I think one thing Ole Miss fans will look back on, I, you know, I, I think about Keith Carter, but real quick, I think I think fans will look back at Matt Luke and go, okay, he wasn't a head coach, but man, he, he was so committed to the program, loved Ole Miss so much, and allowed people to do their job. Moorhead was an absolute and total micromanager. Right, both nice guys. You'd like to have a beer and barbecue sandwich with, smash a cheeseburger later this afternoon with. But uh, Luke did an and Luke did a great job on the offensive line. That's his position, and um, they nailed some some signees, and and that is working out really well for for Lane Kiffin. Keith Carter decided to take a little bit of a chance on Lane Kiffin. And Keith Carter is looking really good on taking that chance on Lane Kiffin because last year was a good year. I mean, you know, considering 10 games, SEC, first year, all the different things that everybody was going through with, with COVID. But it was exciting. It was even very though, exciting. Even though you didn't win as many games as you might have liked, it was still, you were in more games than you thought you might be in. You were in yeah. every game. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty much. And uh, even Florida from the jump. I mean, you know, that was... that. I know Florida won by like 16 or something, but still, you scored a lot. Bama won by like 14, 15, 16. You scored a lot. So you were in, in just about every game, and then you boat raced some people. Um, but if you think about what Keith Carter decided to do, Arkansas, the rumors, Arkansas had him hired, Lane Kiffin. Keith Carter puts an end to that quick and moved fast. They, even the Arkansas AD may, took some shots. Yeah. At, I guess Jimmy Sexton uh, or just the process, whatever. And now here we are with uh, with the lane train riding high and Ole Miss feeling really good about themselves. Um, I mean, I think it's like 99.9% .9 that Ole Miss goes 3-0, and okay? Austin P this weekend, Tulane next. Tulane looked good against Oklahoma. Yeah, but I expect Ole Miss. And they may give Ole Miss some problems at times but I expect Ole Miss to win the game. Flip side of that on Mississippi State is they're an underdog at home this weekend. Oof. They got to find a way to score one more point, just like last weekend. Doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't matter. Low scoring, high scoring, whatever. You know, Leach and them want to find a way to win by what you know one point, six points, whatever. And um, they're going against a again a veteran group out of North Carolina State. That game they were supposed to play last year in Raleigh didn't happen because we only played conference games, and they're bring they're a confident group. I think you can tell that this is a, a co they're expecting big things this year. I mean, NC State's a nice program. Dave Doran's done a good job. You know, he's hung around, won enough to stay. They're you know they're never going to be a a juggernaut or a powerhouse. I mean, Chuck Amato took the job, whatever it was, twenty years ago, leaving the nest of Florida State, Bobby Bowden, and they landed um, Phillip Rivers, mm -hmm. and they had a little bit of stuff going. They had Russell Wilson, but let him go. This wasn't Dave Doran, I don't think. Um, it wasn't. Um, Dave. Uh, they had Russell Wilson. He ended up transferring to Wisconsin. They had another good quarterback in between that I'm missing. But, uh, I mean, they're a, they're a middle-of-the-pack ACC team that sometimes can jump up and win a few games. But keep an eye on that offensive line, those two really, really physical, talented running backs, and see what happens from there. Will Mississippi State be able to air it out and move the ball? We'll see. The polar opposites when it comes to program style. They ran the ball 40 times, 40 on, times. on their uh, week one game over South Florida. Obviously, Mississippi State threw it 47 times. So, uh, quite opposite. Part of that was because, obviously, Leach is going to throw it a lot. The flip side, too, was because they were down by 20. No, no doubt. Um, the quarterback you're thinking of, Jacoby Brissett. Yeah. And he faced off against Dak Prescott in the Belk Bowl. And they smoked him in 2015. And then uh, someone drafted. So the Patriots drafted Brissett ahead of Dak? Yeah, because then yeah. he ended up with the Colts, I think. Yes, he started for, for when um, Andrew Luck disappeared. 
the great disappearance yeah, of Andrew Luck. That's right. Jacoby Brissett was their starter after that. You think Andrew Luck's in like Montana on I, a mountain this morning? That sound. He sounds like the guy who wakes up like with the wolves, drinking like coffee that he gr- hand ground in a, yeah. in a messel and porter or pestle and mortar. Yeah. yeah. Um. He, he does seem like that. He's gonna like teach economics at the University of Montana. <laughs> Yeah, with his Stanford yeah. degree, but he'll walk in in like bare feet with like a long wooden stick, and he yeah. looks like he just he just like walked onto campus out of the woods. Uh, let me ask you this question: You've seen one game now. Are you <laughs> ready to change your season ex- expectation for Mississippi State and Ole Miss based off one game? Do you have? Are you more worried about Mississippi State making a bowl after one game? Are you more interested in or more believing that Ole Miss could make a New Year's Six after one game? That's a good question. Uh, I, all right, let's. I'll start with Mississippi State. I still think that no, I'm not like worried. I, I think that they can find a way to get to six. Um, if if they win on Saturday, that that they could the, they could still going to be difficult. They could find a way to seven. Um, Ole Miss absolutely could have a shot at a New Year's Six ball. When I look at the the league, and when I look at Auburn, LSU, and A and M. This is this. You know how we talk talk about take advantage of your windows of opportunity. Yeah. Mississippi State and Ole Miss have done that at times in the SEC West. Cheryl did it a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, Freeze and Mullen did it this year with Auburn and LSU and A and M. None of those teams are special. Not dominant. Yeah. This is the year to take advantage of that and have a really, really nice year in the SEC West. Plus, you pull two winnable games in Vanderbilt and Tennessee in the East, mm-hmm. and you've, and you've already won your yeah. Power 5 non-conference, so that's four, and you should be fine. That's five, six wins right there, assuming, well, let's not count Tennessee because it's on the road. Vanderbilt plus your four non-con, or uh, three non-con, you're right there. I mean, you're ready to go. So that's that's pretty impressive for, I feel like, an Ole Miss team that, like you said, I think expectations were high, but maybe they're higher after you kind of look the way you did against Louisville. Oh, I don't think there's any question they are. Yeah, they, they are. So so Ole Miss will start 3-0, and and the question is, can can Mississippi State? Uh, but Ole Miss pulls a an early, early week off on September 25th. That's the only negative to their schedule. I mean, I know that they, like, you, when you play in the SEC, you play tough games, but to have your week off both, before the five game stretch instead of in the middle of it, that's really your only factor of worry for Ole Miss, right? Is that attrition, that war of attrition by the time you get through that Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, LSU, Auburn stretch. <laughs> that's brutal. I want to talk about Mississippi State fans. Um I'm there there seems to be a lot of fit throwing going on. Um you're in a rebuild. Joe Moorhead just didn't do what you thought he did. There were wins on the field. 14 wins over two years is considered good in Starkville and Oxford. Um, there was a lot of stuff that uh, that was not done the right way. Never made the headlines. And um, he didn't really allow anybody to do anything, and he micromanaged the process, and he was just overwhelmed from the jump, and uh, that's that's the way it is. But all of a sudden, there's this thing going on where – I guess Mullen spoiled you, and I mean Mullen won. He obviously had more success than anybody else. But goodness gracious, uh, I think when you look at what Leach is doing with Jameer Calvin and Makai Polk, and you're actually throwing the ball down the field, something that you've never done in the history of the program. I mean, you had some really big plays, um, explosive plays on Saturday, twenty plus yards down the field. That's not who you are. You know, you're ground and pound. When you have good teams, you're five and a half yards to carry on the ground. Right? You know? And and you're either, throughout time, you're either running the zone read or the option. Um, I mean, if you think about it, you're playing a super young quarterback in an inexperienced offensive line in a new system, and yet you had some explosive plays on Saturday. And, and guys that were making an impact that had never played a game at Mississippi State in Calvin and Polk, among others. Tulu's still young, you know? I mean, there, there's a lot of Will Rogers, of course, a true sophomore, uh, which is pretty unbelievable. Um, all right, the Out of Bounds Show, 105.9 The Zone. 
Brought to you by Edwin Watts Golf Shop on County Line Road. Edwin Watts Golf Shop on County Line Road.